appears as though we are live. Hi, everybody. Joe Moore, co-founder, CEO of Psychedelics Today. Hope you're having a beautiful day so far. Today, we are hosting a virtual conference with a bunch of amazing guests. Um, first panel here uh, is going to be about patents. What patent? Um, what is patentable in psychedelics? Um, this is a big issue, hot issue. So I'm expecting some really exciting discussion here. So thank you all for being part of that one. And later, um, after this um, particular panel, we'll be hosting a panel called Eyes on Oregon. And that's going to be a fantastic one. I've been running um, a pretty regular bit of content around that uh, on our YouTube channel with um, friend and attorney John Dennis. And it's been really great. So I'm really excited for that panel as well. Going to be a lot of um, depth, I believe, and exploration here. So really excited. So I'll introduce our host, Josh uh, Mazur from Zuber Lawler. Uh, Josh, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about you, Joe? Wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so I'm Josh Mazur. I am the chair of uh, the intellectual property group at Zuber Lawler. Uh, my specialty is, is intellectual property litigation and strategy. Uh, uh, historically, mostly patent, uh, but lately also a fair amount of trademark, especially in kind of the emerging technology space involving cannabis and psychedelics. So that's a brief introduction to me. Let me uh, let me introduce the other members of the panel, and then I'll ask them to each say a few words about themselves. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, what the order is that folks are getting uh, presented with on the screen, so I'm just going to go uh, by the order I'm seeing. First, well, we have my associate, uh, foreign attorney Radhi Shah, who uh, is one of our, our one of our uh, rising stars, I should say, in, in the practice, uh, doing a lot of work in, in in many of the emerging areas that we're dealing with. I also have well, we also have with us Malcolm uh, sorry, Malcolm Barrett Johnson, who's the chief medical officer of Albert Labs. Uh, we have James Lanthier. Am I pronouncing your last name right, James? Good enough. Close enough, you know, as someone who gets his last name mangled frequently, uh, I, I have appreciation for that. And I really do want to thank Joe for pronouncing mine right. That's fair. Uh, or at least the way I do. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, James is the CEO of Mindset Pharma. And uh, then finally, we have uh, Matt Emmer, who's vice president of the healthcare practice at Field Trip Health. So let's see, why don't we kind of go in reverse order of what I did? Uh, maybe Matt, can you say a few words about you and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I actually went through a recent transition. So a month ago, I was VP of healthcare practice at Field Trip Health. Um, I'm now an advisor uh, with Field Trip Health uh, and currently head of development and innovation at Journey Clinical. Uh, kind of my role within the space is really looking at how do we build out the infrastructure uh, and how we actually deliver uh, psychedelic assisted therapies to the actual clients and pa patients who will benefit uh, from these emerging healing modalities. Uh, at Journey Clinical, uh, we're really focused on how do we empower uh, the individual uh, private practice psychotherapists, uh, so really the small businesses, so that they are able to incorporate uh, these novel treatments into their practices. Uh, Field Trip is focused on building out uh, actual clinics uh, for these treatments. Uh, and as it relates to the patents, um, you know, I think in, in both of my roles and, and me personally, um, I'm very passionate about uh, access uh, and what is, how, how do we actually help um, move forward the mainstream adoption and recognition of the efficacy around psychedelic therapies and how can patents both help move that forward um, while also being mindful to ensure that we don't uh, limit innovation uh, and access uh, as we see uh, the psychedelic renaissance unfold. Thanks, Matt. And my apologies for getting your current affiliation wrong. I guess what they, they say is true, that this is indeed a fast moving and fast changing field. It is moving uh, very quickly. There you go. James, uh, please introduce yourself to the group. Yeah, thanks, Josh, and, and thanks so much to Psychedelics Today and, and Zuber Lawler for the invitation. We really appreciate the chance to be on the panel with, uh, with these other great panelists. So I'm the CEO of a company called Mindset Pharma, which is about a three-year-old biotechnology company that was really founded with um, 
a singular focus. So on, on trying to develop uh, chemically novel and, and optimized psychedelic medications. So to just to make that even simpler, we're trying to make, you know, new psychedelic drugs that do a better job, uh, an even better job of treating these different, you know, neuropsychiatric indications than um, the known psychedelic drugs. And that, as I said, that was really our focus from the beginning, because our scientific founders had this point of view that, um, you know, because pharma had really, for at least the last sort of 30, 40 years had really, you know, shied away from psychedelic drugs because of their scheduling, that there was really this sort of one-time opportunity to, to create, um, you know, a really valuable drug discovery business, um, you know, that could, uh, you know, hopefully create, design some new drugs that could address some of the shortcomings of first-generation psychedelic drugs, um, and, you know, crucially that, that, uh, if we were, you know, successful in doing that, that you'd have, you know, drugs that enjoyed full, uh, you know, composition of matter, strong IP rights, and that this would ultimately, um, you know, be really valuable because it was, it was also the view that ultimately, you know, pharma would want to get involved in the psychedelic, in the medical psychedelic space and, and would, um, you know, would probably skip right past um, the first generation drugs and kind of go directly to, um, you know, directly to, to new drugs that had, you know, real novelty associated with them. So we were one of the first groups to start filing patent applications, um, you know, in the space, applying a range of different drug design strategies, first to psilocybin and then to the DMT and 5-MeO DMT backbones. And out of that, we've been able to identify four different families of new drugs that are now covered by nine different provisional patent applications. Um, and I think uh, it's, yeah, so now we've, I, mindset is uh, the first and really so far only, um, you know, psychedelic biotech company to actually form a uh, a partnership with uh, with a big pharma. So back in January, we announced a partnership with uh, Otsuka Pharmaceuticals um, to advance two of our four families, you know, towards the uh, towards the clinic. So, uh, so that's mindset in a nutshell. And uh, yeah, very happy to be here. Fantastic. Thanks, James. Uh, Malcolm, can you introduce yourself? Yes. Thanks, Josh. And uh, again. Thank you again, Psychedelics, today for inviting me. And uh, Josh, thanks for uh, chairing the meeting. So I'm the, I'm the chief medical officer of a company called Albert Labs. We, we've been going about two and a half years now. We originally came out of Canada. Then we transferred a lot of our, our arrangements over to Portugal. And I'm based in the, in the UK. And uh, we're doing our original you know, clinical trials and that in the UK for a number of reasons. I, I'm a UK trained physician. I, I, my background is also regulatory science, so I used to work with the MHIA, the UK regulatory authorities over here. And I think the regulatory side, as well as the patent side, is very, very interesting. And that's what I think will come up later as well. Albert Labs is focused on producing a novel psilocybin. And we're going to expand that further as well going forward. And we're using mycelium-based products. So it's a biologically-based product. And that produces a whole mass of interesting areas in terms of patentability and regulatory authority licensability too. And we're looking for our first indication in anxiety and depression in cancer patients. I used to do oncology many years ago as well. And as I think James was saying, you know, we're looking to push forward the boundaries of this area because really, certainly in the depression anxiety field, the treatments we've had so far, like the SSRIs, really let us down quite badly. We haven't had many advanced in this area. The SSRIs haven't got the best of safety profiles either. So it's a really, really exciting area to work in. And we came to the UK because we've got some amazing people working over here. With us. The regulatory authorities in the UK are also extremely good at being very pragmatic. Although they're very similar still, although after Brexit things changed a little bit, as the European authorities are. So the regulatory side is very similar, the patentability side is very similar. And there's a lot of associations as well with the FDA as well, which I've worked with in the past too. So although we're UK based, the transferability of the patent discussions we're going to be having, indeed the licensing authority discussions as well, are very, very equitable. So 
very nice to meet you all and uh, look forward to the discussion later. Thanks, Malcolm. And last but definitely not least, uh, my colleague, Roddy. Can you introduce yourself, Roddy? Thanks, Josh. Um, so, hey, everybody. My name is Roddy, and I am a biochemist turned lawyer. Um, I wanted to help the inventors who I worked with before to monopolize on their inventions, and that's where I come in. And I'm currently working with Zuber Lawler as a foreign attorney, where I work uh, as a patent prosecutor, I basically uh, am involved with all aspects of patent prosecution from filing to the grant. And after, like, what do you do with the patent that you have? Like, how do you monopolize that? How do you earn from your patent? So that's where uh, that's where we help. And uh, I also uh, am involved in, in helping companies with their uh, with the FDA part of the regulations of advising uh, how to go about when you have to uh, reach out to the FDA or like for the approvals. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited to be on this panel with all the guests, it's, it's gonna be great. And I think one of the biggest questions that I have heard and everybody's asked me is, can you patent psych psychedelics? Like, uh, because psilocybin is something, or like you cannot patent a plant, right? So like. How do you go about this? I think this is a great panel and it's going to be exciting to get everybody's views on, 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 their, on, their, on their idea of patents in psychedelics. Maybe actually that's a great place to kick us off is uh, with actually the title of our session, which is what is patentable when you're talking about uh, psychedelics. Um, to, uh, Roddy, if you want to give kind of a, a the general idea of it, just from the, the outside lawyer's perspective, that would be great. Right. So let's start with what is a patent. Like a, a basic idea is a patent gives an individual or company ownership over an invention and then prevents others from using their invention without licensing it. Right. So it is not possible to patent nature, such as naturally occurring plant materials. It is possible, however, to opt in patent prosecution on isolated synthetical or semi-synthetical produced compounds useful uh, to ensure quality proportionate of a pharmaceutical product. Um, like, for example, pat patents uh, encompassing synthetic routes, crystal forms, etc., with optimized pharmaceutical characteristics. That is the general overview of what is patented in this field. Yeah. Thanks. And, and I do want to add one little gloss on that, which is um, I think folks often who are not lawyers don't recognize that there's a difference between the, 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 what the patent grants you is not actually a right to practice a given invention. It gives you only a right, at least under U.S. law, a right to exclude others from using the invention. And that tends to be a, a critical distinction when you're talking especially about, uh, about products that have at least legal questions over them as far as whether, whether they are legal under various, uh, under the various nested laws that we deal with. Um, can also, that can also affect remedies that are available, but certainly um, the, it, it's an interesting thing because what you've got is potentially a right to prevent others from doing something that the government already wants to prevent them to do from doing. But uh, that's kind of the, the landscape that we work in. So thank you for that good, great overview there, Roddy. I guess then for the, uh, for the folks who are actually in industry, um, how does IP affect the strategy and affect uh, the way that you're thinking about uh, the, the products and services that you're trying to, to uh, create and bring to market? Uh, I suppose I should choose someone to start with. Why don't we start with James? Well, it's it's been central, you know, to mindsets strategy from you know from from the very beginning. I mean, our 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 science our scientific founders really had this. Um, you know, bias that the level of, uh, you know, the competitive barriers, you, you might be successful, you know, as Compass has been in, in getting a, a patent on, you know, on a formulation of psilocybin um, and others, you know, might be as well. But ultimately, the, the level of, of, you know, real competitive barriers that that gives you as the patent holder is, you know, significantly less than, if you're patenting, um, you know, a drug with a, a totally new, uh, you know, active pharmaceutical ingredient. 
um, because at the end of the day, it's it's not psilocybin itself that Compass has patented. It's it's uh, it's a formulation of of psilocybin, and there's really nothing that precludes you know others from coming along with their own formulations. And so, as as great as as uh, psilocybin is, and first generation drugs are, um, and I definitely think you know there's a there's a role for them. Um, you know, we, we felt like first generation drugs will fairly quickly go the route of generic, uh, you know, competition once, um, once you have, you know, FDA approval and, uh, and, and that, you know, there's a, there's a lot more defensible value to be had in drugs that are, um, you know, drugs that are, are novel, of course, you know, the first generation drugs do a pretty good job of, of, uh, of treating these different indications as all, all the, you know, data has shown so far. So, you know, if your mindset or your others, um, trying to do, you know, similar, similar stuff, you know, n novelty alone really isn't, isn't enough. You've got actually a pretty high, um, you know, bar to climb to, to try to create drugs that are, um, you know, that are differentiated as well. And, and that's been what, what we've, uh, you know, been, been trying to do since the beginning. So that's kind of the, the, the novel compound approach. Um, Matt, I believe you have some thoughts about the, the uh, existing compound, if you will, the legacy compound, the, the, the uh, naturally occurring and generations of compound. Yeah, I think, you know, kind of from, from, from my role, um, you know, I'm really focused on supporting the mainstream adoption of these therapies. Uh, and as I think a lot of us are aware, part of that within our current medical paradigm and drug approval process is that it's extremely expensive to go through uh, the FDA approval process um, and other regulatory processes in order to actually bring these molecules to market, whether that's uh, a known um, existing psychedelic, uh, such as psilocybin, or any of the number of novel psychedelics that are being developed. And I think what's so important is that we allow for companies and organizations that are undertaking that effort uh, to be able to do that uh, and to be able to um, cover the cost and, and be rewarded for uh, the tremendous amount of effort that it takes to uh, bring these molecules to market. Uh, on the other side, you know, I'm also very focused on, you know, the individual practitioners and the small businesses. So how do you get these molecules into their hands and empower them to actually be able to integrate this into the work that they're doing? Um, and similar to some of the other points being made, I think when you're looking at uh, known psychedelic molecules where it's more around the uh, manufacturing process uh, that can be patented versus novel psychedelics uh, where you're able to actually patent the molecule itself. Um, there's certainly, you know, business and strategic considerations uh, around which avenue uh, may be preferred. Uh, I think that, you know, when looking at the end user perspective, I think it's so important that we get uh, the known psychedelic molecules um, out and available to people. I also think that it's so important that we continue to innovate because um, I think it's already recognized that there's going to be a large variation of different types of psychedelic molecules that might better suit uh, individuals depending on their specific condition uh, and any way to be able to, you know, broaden that access uh, and give, you know, patients and clients uh, more options and opportunity, I think is a positive. Gotcha. And Malcolm, how about you? How does IP play into your uh, into the work that you and uh, and your company are doing? Yeah, Josh, thank you. I know it, it's absolutely crucial. It was one of the key um, areas for differentiation discussion when the company was formed. We're going down a a route which is 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 quite difficult in some ways when you're looking at a natural product made made out of the mycelium of the actual, um, you know plant itself it, it makes it makes it slightly more tricky but it's very important though because as james was saying we've got basically a product there which has got its own fingerprint it's actually i it's it's its own product it won't be copied very easily in that sense 
And also that what that allows you to do, it allows you to manufacture that and produce that for a series of bioreactors. Effectively, it is in the same category as we would have for a pharma product in the sense that it is a biologic. And biologics have got a number of areas of interest in terms of pharma, because if you go after a generic, you have to design basically a biosimilar. That makes it more tricky. When we were designing a system as well for actually producing this, we, we thought about things like bioreactors and the temperatures and pressures under which it was going to be produced. And that basically allows you to have like a stackable series of patterns for the production system. So that's very important when you've got a biologic, when you've got a natural product there. That allows you to take it forward. Now, as I think we had that discussion a little bit earlier, you know, when you're also looking at this, you also have to look at the context under which it's being produced, under which it's going to be licensed, because the licensing process for natural products is very, very important. If, as James said, you have a, a product which can be copied, that means that someone can come along and basically nick it and nick your data effectively and take it forward. If you've got a, a product there which is sort of got its own fingerprint, then you come into the realms of regulatory licensing, which in itself, although it's not the patentable side, forms part of the whole, where you get more marketing authorization that allows you, um, it allows you exclusivity for 10 or 11 years. Now, that's very, very important. So it's all part of this patentability and market exclusivity, which you gain from producing a product and data exclusivity as well. So it was incredibly important, and especially in a biological con context. And actually, I guess that that kind of highlights that maybe the uh, uh, maybe the title of the the program that we've got here is a little bit, you know, although it's very broad, kind of unnecessarily constraining. Really, what we should be talking about is what uh, what intellectual property protections are available or related protections are available, right? The, the, um, especially when you're talking about uh, approval processes that happen. Uh, given governmental agencies, uh, that that also provides a barrier against entry by others and, and a safety uh, component as well. But particularly, we were talking about uh, psychedelics. There is a history there and a reluctance there to move forward that um, is many in many ways ordinarily designed to prevent harm uh, right, in, in, in keeping with the first do no harm principle, but can end up... Uh, having an impact on on the innovation as well um let's see so so let's talk about actually then the and i, I think um matt was starting to get into this as well the, the question of you know uh basically patenting molecules uh versus patenting methods of treatment versus, versus patenting methods of production um what do each of you favor and and why And feel free to jump in. You don't have to wait for me to call on someone. <laughs> Not class. <laughs> James, do you want to go first? Or? No, go ahead. I, I think it's everything, Josh, to be perfectly honest. I think it's a patentability of it in terms of production methods. It is the therapy and the indication you're going for as well. So if you have an indication which allows you to use that in that area, as I said, you've got up to 11 years, certainly in the European Union, and it's similar to the FDA as well in many ways. So you've got the use of that product, the patentability of the stackable, in our case, bioreactors, how to put that together, and the market exclusivity you gain on both the market ability to use that product outside of a generic usage, and also the data exclusivity as well. So say in the European Union, if I produce a clinical trial and that produces data, I have got exclusive use of that, which you could say is a sort of patentability, it's data protection. But then it, you've got another two years of market exclusivity too. And then you, as you add other indications to that, you get additional years of exclusivity. So I think it's everything together. It's the stackability of your patents in terms of production, which could be many, many. And, you know, you can have things like bioreactor design, different pressures, different ways of constructing the medicine, uh, different formulations to some extent as well together with how you design these clinical trials and what the indications and outputs are for the data. I mean, no, no, no question, the more patent protection and the more patents that you have issued, you know, as, as a for-profit business, you know, the, the, the better and the stronger your, your position is, I think, and I know it's a great, it's a great question. And I think it's, it's, uh, you know, one, a lot, a lot of, uh, 
you know, folks who are in, involved in the space or who are, you know, watching it and have, um, you know, strong feelings about it. Definitely, you know, the, 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 the compass patent around um, some of the, the, the treatment, uh, you know, the, the, the physical characteristics of, of uh, you know, the psilocybin clinic treatment and the, the colors on the walls and the music and the stuff like that. You know, you don't have to be um, an IP expert, and I'm not, uh, uh, to find that, you know, pretty galling and, and have it feel like a real kind of, uh, you know, overreach. I think it's important, and uh, definitely um, the lawyers can, I'm sure, support this. You know, all kinds of patents get issued. Just because they get issued doesn't mean that they um, are likely to, you know, to, to withstand a challenge or be, you know, in, enforceable in any way. But that I know Compass has gotten a lot of flack for that one, and you know, um, rightfully so, because it all seems, uh, you know, quite obvious, right? Uh, you know. <laughs> Even beyond that, is it even a technical solution? And I, I so yeah. uh, I, you know, and I, I talk about that in the perspective of, uh, at least in the US, right? You've got uh, basically development of psychedelic technology happening now against a backdrop of a real change in our Supreme Court's approach to what is patentable. Mm -hmm. um, and the case law is really still shaking out about that. I actually have a case on appeal to the federal circuit, which is our appeals court for patent cases right now involving nothing having to do with psychedelics, having to do with uh, computer technology and com data compression technology. But um, the question, for instance, of whether something is actually a technological invention, uh, often the way that courts evaluate that is from the perspective of if a human being can do it on their own, it's probably not technological. Whether that is, you know, that's kind of a guidepost. It's not a, a hard and fast rule, but it's one of the ways that, especially, we look at computer software or you know, or computer-related inventions. Uh, and I think, as it as they're applied to, for instance, the color of paint on the wall, by definition, that's something that a human being can do on their own. Um, and it would be an interesting question to see whether that passes muster under under U.S. law. It would be Section 101 of the of the Patent Act. Um, let's see. Uh, Matt, I don't think, did we touch yeah. on you for this? Did we give you a chance? I don't no. want to take away your chance to speak. Yeah, happy to jump in here. I think that, you know, I think patents are important in each of those three areas. I think on, like, I think the way to potentially think about it is patents are a tool and incentive to encourage innovation. So anything that requires a significant investment of either time or money, uh, you know, often requires an incentive, often in the form of a patent, um, in order to encourage that innovation. So, in terms of patents around the, the the manufacturing process or the formulation of known molecules, uh, given the current scheduling, it's so important that there is incentive for companies to uh, move those forward. So, I think it's important to have patent patents there. Uh, same thing with novel um, drug development. Uh, and then on, you know, the experience side, I think if, if there's, you know, true novel developments there, uh, they're proprietary, that it's important to uh, really protect, um, you know, that, that innovation and the time and effort uh, that someone put into that. I think it's also really important to put out, point out that uh, the underground community over, you know, the past number of decades and even dating back, you know, centuries before, uh, prohibition uh, was in place, uh, has developed a wealth of knowledge uh, that has really influenced and informed a lot of the developments in this space. Uh, and it's important that that's not ignored either. Either So you have some really, truly amazing people that have developed um, some amazing approaches around these treatment modalities. Uh, and due to the laws and regulations, a lot of those aren't publicly known or publicly available. Um, and even if they aren't, uh, I think it's important to recognize that that that, that knowledge is out there uh, and that that should provide a guidance around, you know, what can be patented, that just because you have a, a company that then becomes um, aware of some of those practices, that a lot of them um, are commonly known within the underground communities. And I think that's important to recognize when you think about uh, what can be patented around the experience and protocol side of these treatments.
Yeah, and actually, um, since we're now getting into the question of prior art, which is inherently a legal question, maybe I'll throw it open to Radhi. Radhi, do, do you see any particular uh, prior art or, 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 you know, background issues uh, that apply to, to psychedelics in particular? I think the biggest issue is that um, there are, the psychedelics has been being used since a long time underground by shamans, rituals, so it's very difficult for the patent office to, to recognize like where like, to see if there are patent if there are literatures out there or there are inventions out there which have already been used. So I think as for prior art, that that is the biggest challenge. And uh, what there's one more thing that uh, that can be challenging as well when it comes to patent prosecution per se is um, like. A lot of patent applications have uh, psychedelic substances um, in their in their patent in their applications, and some of them can uh, face something called um, anticipation and in inherency, which basically means that let's say there's a I saw a patent where um, it was it, the application is on food allergy and it has LSD being used to treat the food allergy. So uh, this has not been proved yet, but what the what the what the problem here is that LSD can in the past be you may have been used for treating food allergy, right? And even though you like LSD might be novel to to to, um, to treat food allergy, it can still it has been there in the past, so it can face anticipation by inherency. So these are some of the challenges that the patent office is seeing, and it's the patent office in the U.S. at least. It's it, they, they don't have the database yet to know or see what's what's out there, what psychedelic materials out there already being used, and how it's being used. So that would be interesting to see um, of how that's going to get overcome, because that is winning in a lot of bad patents, and that is not good for the industry. Yeah, and, and speaking, thanks, Roddy. That's an excellent, uh, I think, an excellent perspective on the the prosecution perspective, uh, the patent prosecution perspective. And by the way, for those who are not familiar with with patent jargon, patent prosecution is what we use is the term we use to refer to the process of actually getting a patent issued by uh, by a regulatory authority in the U.S. It's the USPTO. Uh, it's other entities elsewhere. Um, uh, it, and, Roddy, as, as she's mentioned, is uh, does a lot of patent prosecution. I, by contrast, do a lot of patent litigation. Um, and my perspective on this is that it's often difficult uh, to show invalidation, for instance, by uh, showing public use or, or, or prior sale, right? First sale of a, of a given product um, when you're talking about something that was illegal. Uh, unlike, for instance, trademark law, where the um, the, the question of prior legal or of first legal sale becomes critical. Um, in patent law, it's not a restriction to legal sales necessarily, but darned if you can find good documentation that establishes a, an illegal sale, right? That's that's not typically going to be the case. Uh, and you have a situation with patents uh, and with patent litigation in particular, where um, corroboration becomes incredibly important. In other words, it's not enough to simply have testimony uh, from someone, particularly if that someone has an interest in, uh, in, for instance, trying to invalidate or trying to maintain the validity of a patent. You need to have corroboration by some type of some other type of evidence, whether it's other testimony corroborating that that happened or better yet, documentation. And that, the, that documentation is much harder to come by when you're talking about um, uh, about uses and products or or, uh, or devices for that matter that uh, for whatever reason uh, have a history of having been illegal and therefore a history of uh, people trying to avoid effectively uh, creating documentation. Mm -hmm. So it does present a, a, a significant issue here since I think we all agree that the goal shouldn't be to simply take what's already been known and been used for years or decades or millennia um, and try to you know, create a barrier to entry for others trying to use that. The goal should be to promote innovation. Uh, the goal should be to reward those who are innovative. On the other hand, you also don't want innovation for the sake of innovation that doesn't improve things. So these are these are interesting te uh, tensions that are present 
you know, throughout the IP space, but in particular in the context of psychedelics and, and, and other kind of uh, emerging um, psychoactive technologies. Um, so that's my spiel. Sorry, that, that kind of, I, I didn't mean to, uh, to, to stop the discussion on it, but I did want to kind of add that litigation perspective. Um, what do we think, but actually maybe that's a good transition to, to talking about uh, the impact that, uh, that patenting uh, of whether you're talking about treatment methodologies or uh, production methodologies or uh, for that matter, molecules, what kind of impact is that going to have on the delivery of psychedelic therapies, it's especially in the, uh, in the, um, the kind of psychiatric space? Um, I throw it open. Well, well, Josh, it will, it will obviously limit it because as you were saying, the trouble is if you've got that in place, you're absolutely right. You don't want to limit um, the use of things which have been around for millennia or hundreds or years or from the 1960s or whatever. But unfortunately, that, that of course limits industry coming in. You know, if you're going trying to get monies in from venture capital people, they're going to say, okay, well, why is this going to be special? And that's going to, that's going to be very limited. Show me your barriers to entry. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's a big problem. So, uh, you know, it, it is it is an issue. And I think... Um, I know it's probably slightly different to the European market to maybe the United States market, but over here, that's, that's, that's a, that's a huge issue. And I suppose one issue that I would love to have some clarity on is as well. And I don't know because I'm, you know, patents, patents isn't necessarily my speciality is, is, is this global, you know, say we had in America, you had certain techniques or certain things from shaman that were being used. Um, it wasn't common in the European union would that patentability be applicable in the European Union or say in Australia or other parts of the world? That would be an interesting point of discussion. Yeah, and that's going to be dependent in large part on whatever the, the governing patent law is in that jurisdiction and it varies from place to place. Yeah. Um, I don't have section 102 and 103 of the Patent Act in front of me at the moment, of the US Patent Act in front of me at the moment, but I will say there are distinctions among the different categories as to whether the uh, the prior use in question need be domestic or whether it can be anywhere in the world. I, I, I tend to think it's it's to your question josh it's it's more going to be you know the utility of of the drugs that that drives you know their adoption and and we'll we'll continue to to draw in you know more investment so as as you know as the first generation drugs get approved you know regardless of of uh of what rights exist you know what ip rights exist on you know, their manufacturer or um, on different indications or not, you know, we all, all of us who are close to, you know, watch the data know that or have a high level of confidence that the drugs, um, you know, are going to do a really good job or at least a better job than the current treatments um, for, you know, not only treatment resistant depression or PTSD, but probably like a much wider range of indications. And, you know, one thing we know about like the pharma space is if, if, you know, if something, you know, works, it, it invites all kinds of, of copycat, you know, competition. And, um, and so I don't think, I think, look, it's, 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 uh, it feels, you know, it doesn't feel right to see groups try to patent, stuff that's been around for in decades, whether that's in the underground or it's just simply, you know, knowledge that's, you know, quite, you know, self-evident. But I tend to think at the end of the day that those right, rights holders won't really, we'll just find a lot of competition if it's, if, if the treatments are successful and, and are going to have a hard time, um, you know, policing, uh, you know, their, their rights because other groups will set up, you know, if it's a, if it's treating using LSD to treat a food allergy, someone will figure out, you know, a workaround pretty quickly. And, uh, and so I don't really think it'll necessarily limit the, um, the growth of the overall psychedelic medicine space. I, I could be wrong. Maybe that's overly hopeful, but, uh, but I just think you'll see a lot of competition, um, pretty quickly once, you know, you have FDA approval for, for psilocybin and for MDMA. And in fact, from the from the legal landscape, I should should also add at least the U.S. legal landscape. Um, 
one interesting thing that happens when you're talking about FDA approval is that once you have FDA approval for a given indication, treating physicians are not limited to using a given compound for that indication. Um, it, it's kind of an interesting aspect of U.S. law. I don't know that that's internationally applicable, but under U.S. law, at least the fact that uh, basically once you get the door open a crack, it opens it wide, right. uh, which creates opportunities. It also creates, I think, probably some understandable reluctance on the part of regulatory authorities uh, because they are concerned that if they allow this little wedge in, the door is open. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Josh. It, it, it applies in the UK and across Europe too. So as a physician, I can prescribe once it's got a license and in other areas as well. If I decide to go and prescribe morphine for your headache, it'd be a pretty stupid thing for me to do as a doctor, but I could do it. And so you're right. It allows that, that, that door to be opened. Of course, you have to take account of the safety profiles, but it does. And it, 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 that's why I think the regulatory side is a co- area for discussion together with the patency because as james said you know it, it won't stop another group coming in once you've got that door open with the fda or the mea and then taking that forward and trying again another product in a similar space the indications and the clinical use of it is what drives its use and drives a commercial uptake by other companies as well it always has and always will and that's something we can learn a lot from and we do from pharma yeah, I'd agree with that point that, you know, the patents are so important, especially on the drug development side, which I think has been a focus in the psychedelic space overall. And I think something that I've had conversations about is, you know, the fact that the psychedelic treatment experience, you know, is a lot more than, you know, only the psychedelic molecules. So we're at the stage right now where, you know, there's such an effort to just get those molecules available to people so that they can start working with them. Uh, but you know, what I've seen both at journey clinical and I was at field trip is there are many different other therapeutic modalities that complement the psychedelic molecules themselves really beautifully. Uh, and that, you know, that can really influence, you know, the outcomes and, and the efficacy. So when we're thinking about patents, you know, if, if we're trying to support innovation but avoid exploit exploitation, I think that exploitation can go both directions where if there are common therapeutic practices and then there's one company that's trying to patent those, you know, that's potentially exploitive. But likewise, if there's, you know, a, a team that puts in a lot of effort to really develop something that's truly novel and then that's being copied uh, and, and, you know, taken away from them, that's also exploitive. Uh, so I think it's really interesting to, you know, as, as we have this conversation, you know, keep in mind that, you know, I think a lot of the focus has been on the the molecules themselves, but there's so much more to psychedelic assisted therapy than than just the molecules. Um, I think I really like to emphasize that it tends to be an, a an active treatment process that really um, involves the active engagement of the clients and patients that are going through these treatments. Uh, and it's, you know, important to really think about you know, who's facilitating and developing, you know, the approaches and protocols that, you know, facilitate that flow and movement through the treatment experience. And, yeah. and it's a great point. And, and I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously probably biased, but I, I tend to think that, uh, you know, the, the, the molecules um, and, and, and the rights around them also help drive the investment in, the, the treatment methodologies and the the trial and error and, and all the work that you know Matt and and others are, are doing to to figure out you know what the right ways are to conduct you know psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and and I think you know that that's at a basic level why IP rights uh, you know are important I think you know that this this kind of argument that well you know Maps has been able to to really carry the ball with without you know ip rights you know my, maps has done you know incredible work but i think um you know we're all we're also here you know in in part thanks to the work that compass has done and and they they're a you know for-profit um yeah you know privately funded um you know company and and i, I think you know without with all without all that kind of formation of of capital behind behind, you know, psilocybin and behind now the, you know, 
new, you know, drug discovery efforts, you know, we, we don't also get the, the capital, you know, lining up to create the clinical, the, the clinic infrastructure and, and, you know, do the work to figure out what that piece needs to look like. So, um, yeah, the patents are important. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. And, and even maps, they, they still have IP rights, and that's held by a public benefit corporation that then is owned by the nonprofit. But they're even recognizing that, you know, MDMA won't be free. And by charging for MDMA, it will support the broader work that maps is doing. So they're also um, looking at the IP rights that they will they will have as well. And uh, adding my, my patent litigation perspective in here, I should mention a lot of folks don't know about this, uh, or at least a lot of, a lot of non-lawyers and non-patent litigators don't know about this, but there's actually, again, U.S. patent law because we litigate in given jurisdictions and that's my focus. Um, there is what's called, a, uh, basically, there's an exception um, for, uh, for being able to assert infringement against uh, treating physicians for following a, uh, a patented method of treatment. In other words, you can't go with, if, even if you get a, a patent on a particular method of treatment using, for instance, psilocybin, um, under US law, you cannot go after an individual practitioner uh, who is using that method. You could conceivably, and actually this has rarely been tested by the courts, it, it's a very strange, uh, very strange um, uh, portion of the statute uh, leading us to suggest that perhaps the uh, uh, the legislators who were who proposed it and were thinking about it and voted on it may have been indulging in a bit of psychedelics themselves. Um, but I just, uh, I don't think Orrin Hatch would have been involved in that. But uh, that being as it may, the um, it, it's not really clear what this uh, exception means. There was very little legislative history. There was essentially a debate between two different senators on the floor of the Senate. It's the only references to it. And they took diametrically opposed views of what the legislation actually meant, um, leading us with, with very little in the way of, of guidance as to, uh, to how to apply this, uh, how to apply the, the treating physician exception, um, including whether because a treating physician has it, it, at least is cannot be uh, cannot be uh, gone against right cannot be sued for practicing a given uh, a given patented method. What about those who assist either by providing information uh, or by providing the the tools, namely the, the psychedelics themselves? Uh, can those people be uh, be gone against under the patent laws uh, for damages or for an injunction that would prevent them from helping? physicians do something that they do now under U.S. law have a right to do. Uh, there are open questions that haven't really been addressed uh, in any significant way yet, but uh, I suspect that they will be by someone over the coming years. Josh, that's um, very, very interesting, actually, isn't it? I think as a, as a prescribing physician, I'm very, very um, heartened by that. I think if I was pursued for prescribing or doing a therapeutic treatment, for, um, I'd be a bit, uh, I'd be a bit miffed, actually, for that. Um, so, sure. Yeah. Uh, and unlike many other, you know, very specific provisions of law, it, it came about because there was uh, an instance in which a treating physician was in fact sued under, and, and, and the suit was successful. I wow. believe the suit was successful. Uh, and that created a desire on the part of, uh, of the legislature to try to correct that, to try to make sure that physicians weren't having to defend themselves against patent suits uh, simply for practicing medicine. That said, it also, I think, illustrates the problem of creating statutes to deal with precise uh, precise fact situations that have come up um, and to try to address them and not really recognize how uh, how more edge cases might apply. Ooh, what is that ding? <laughs> it's probably telling us we're uh, really close to the end. Oh, so okay. I want to yeah, make sure we hit a couple questions from the audience. Oh, okay? sure. Yeah, I have not been monitoring the questions, Joe. If you, if you have... Yeah, I'll go ahead and read some. some. <clears throat> Just read the really good ones, though, please. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to rank them. I'll start with uh, the first one I see. Uh, first one here, um, where would one patent treatments with uh, substances, which are still, uh, it's not going to fly for me right now, sorry. Um, can you describe the process of turning an idea into a patent, um, specifically around like drug discovery here? Like this is kind of maybe a little too high level, but maybe somebody could just take a really quick stab at that one. 
so for instance, like um, Compass. Um, so like the idea is let's go ahead and get some patents because we want to push this thing through. We want to have some protection for our investors. Our IP is critical to our investor strategy and execution strategy. So like maybe anybody want to speculate on that or any kind of stories out there? It's okay if we need to pass on that one. Um, so I can take this, I guess. Uh, so what we usually do is, uh, it obviously depends case by case, where you got to see what is your invention exactly, what is your molecule, are you, are, do you want to patent a molecule, are you looking to patent uh, a formulation, etc. So uh, you cannot patent an idea per se, right? Uh, so you have to, like, in, in the drug industry, we see if it's a formulation or the development of the drug, uh, or like, is it novel or is it innovative? So that's usually how like you go about deciding if you can put in your application or not. Um, so there's nothing patentable like an idea in in in, in US under the US PDO. Uh, but yeah, we like I work with inventors every day, and we sit down and we see like, okay, so these are the things. This, like this is yeah sure you have the molecule it's already out there but this is innovative this is what you're trying to put extra this is this is what brings the like, x and y brings the result y, uh, z so the z is what we patent right so um on a very general basic level this is how uh you go about deciding if you want to patent or not great thank you for that um next one here this one is um can't compass specific. They're they're kind of the punching bag for everybody that's interested in. Um, being and that's probably a good opportunity that. for me to say that that the opinions expressed by especially uh, Rati and me are our own opinions, not the opinions of Super Lawler, and not the opinions of any of our clients. I think that the you know also applies the not the opinions of our companies to the rest of the panelists. And I always like to add an additional disclaimer, which is you know the additional lawyer's disclaimer, which is if this <laughs> has been legal advice. It would be followed by a bill. <laughs> In some of my shows, I say, uh, "Whose lawyer are you?" <laughs> the answer is nobody's, <laughs> unless you paid me and I've agreed. All right, next up here: How likely is Compass to be granted a patent on holding hands, soft lighting, and soft furniture <laughs> during therapeutic <laughs> sessions? Is there precedent for patents being granted for things that are this obvious? Because this is part of the whole tradition. My understanding is, and this is a preface is this was part of describing how their patent was going to be used and not really with any intention of excluding other people from holding hands. Uh, fortunately, I fortunately, I haven't read the Compass patent, and so I can, can take it out to a level of abstraction beyond that. You know, again, I think it comes down when you're talking about human interactions, simply human interactions without a technological component to them. Um, that's unlikely to be upheld as a patentable invention in a court if it's going to be enforced. Um, and one nice thing about the patentability, uh, basically about, about the challenges to patentability is that in most courts in the US these days, um, that is a question that it can be addressed at the threshold of the case before there's even an answer filed, uh, which means that we're not taking the time that we need to to get to whether it's obvious or anticipated, which are again, terms of patent to art or patent, patent terms of art to meaning um, anticipated means the entire invention is pre-existing and obvious is that you know maybe the entire invention isn't pre-existing but once you knew what the prior art was you would obviously go and 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 do what the patent is calling for mm. and i think it's pertinent to note here that this is just an application uh there's a lot of things that go through between an application and a grant um, there are a lot of like when you're applying for a patent, your application is kind of your claims are different than what you get a grant on, because uh, what usually applicants do is they put a broad claim out there and they let the examiners decide what goes through and what does not. So in the end, there might be a way different patent, which would not have all these aspects or all these claims and would not even have such a broad claim. So. Uh, com in, in terms of compass, this, it's just an application. We still have to see what the examiner would allow and will not. So, but is that is that generally the case? And you chuck as much stuff at the wall and see how much it will stick, or is it is that sort of condemned as not being a very good way of practicing? Um, it, it is. 
it, it is a good practice, I would say, because you you, you want to uh, claim as much as you can. And maybe sometimes it sticks and you get a grant on that, right? So uh, usually the patent practitioners do let you uh, have broad claims. They apply for broad. It obviously depends case by case. So uh, as for Compass, yeah, it is uh, controversial because uh, should their attorneys have provided such broad claims because this is general, like holding hands, general, like, so it is pretty controversial, but uh, good practice or bad practice, I think it depends. They usually do apply for broad claims. And again, you know, I think this comes back to, rem to remembering that patents, despite I think a lot of common misconceptions, are really just rights to exclude. So it's not necessarily saying you're going to practice in that area. You're just trying to stop others from practicing in that area. And it can actually end up being, some, you end up in some interesting situations where there can inevitably inventions, patentable inventions happen within a scope of an unpatentable prior art or a patentable prior art. So you can have a situation where you've got a relatively broad patent that was already issued by what to one company um, and then you can have a narrow patent that uh, that uh, basically it deals with only a, a subsection if you think about a Venn diagram of invention here um, a, a small portion of it and although the person who gets or the company that gets that smaller patent uh, that's subsumed within the larger one doesn't have a right to practice it neither does the company that had the larger one in other words, the, you can prevent someone from patent, from practicing something that is within the scope of their patent by getting an additional patented invention within it. These are, these are the, the angels that dance on the head of my pen. It's not like a game of chess up here, does it really? God. Quite. Yeah. <clears throat> Joe, All do right. we have uh, more questions that, uh, that, that <laughs> merit coming to the top of the food chain? Anything about data. IP? I don't think so. I think we might be good for now. So let's um, thank everybody. And then uh, we will have time to chat for about a half an hour in rooms before we kick off the next session. Um, Josh, Fantastic. In that case, I, I want to, to thank all the panelists. I think this was, you know, uh, frankly, the process of leading up to this and also the process of doing this today, just I think gives you an idea of how to scratch the surface of what's a very, very deep question that, uh, frankly, that the answers are not necessarily clear about yet, uh, but hopefully will become more clear over the coming years. So thank you, uh, all of you, uh, Matt, uh, James, Malcolm, Roddy. Uh, it's been a delight to get to do this with you uh, and looking forward Likewise. to talking with you further. You. And, and there you go. And so I guess now we're jumping into individual uh, virtual uh, little tables. All yes. right. Thanks Thank you, Josh. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. We'll see you all in a little bit. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much. <laughs>